Welcome to New Life Online. We're glad to have you with us again tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about when God doesn't make sense. Or to put it another way, specifically we're going to talk about when it seems like God isn't paying attention. So with all that's been going on in our world the last couple of weeks, I'm really hoping this will minister to you. So please share this, uh, share this post on your feed and uh, let's get the word out. And let's spend the next hour together worshiping Jesus and hearing from the Holy Spirit tonight. Can we do that? If you have a prayer request, please uh, share it in the comments below. Or you can send us a direct message either way. And we'll uh, take some time to pray over your needs later in the service tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we invite you by your Spirit to speak in this place. Lord, as we're here in this sanctuary and as we are making a sanctuary over the internet tonight. We ask you to move and speak to each one. Let there be healing, hope, direction, peace, comfort, whatever the need may be. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. And we look to you and trust you for your provision tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom. Lord, my life is in 
myself away you came hallelujah jesus we give you praise tonight wherever you are watching tonight would you just lift your hands you know you say well nobody's here with me you feel silly doing it by yourself but you know what the lord's there with you we're gathered together in his name we may not be in the same building but we are still gathered in spirit and the Holy Spirit is here. So let's just worship him for just a moment. Lord, we give you praise. We thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of adversity, in the midst of uncertainty. We thank you, God, that you are not only faithful, but God, you meet every need that we have. That, Lord, you <clears throat> bring healing and comfort, peace. And I thank you, Father, that we are not abandoned. We are sons and daughters embraced by our loving Heavenly Father. And so, Lord, we just welcome you into our midst tonight. We invite you by your Spirit to speak to us. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts would be changed even just a little bit more, that we could better reflect the character, the love, and the grace and glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray your blessings upon everyone watching tonight. In the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Wasn't the worship great tonight? And uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Keith, for, um, for leading us in worship. And I see right now we have uh, a pretty good number watching, and so we're thankful that you're here tonight. <clears throat> and I uh, saw that Brother Darren English is watching. Hey, Darren, good to, good to see you uh, watching with us tonight. And uh, so we're just going to have church tonight. I want us to uh, uh, pray over a couple of needs, uh, and if I can talk to just our congregation for just a moment. Uh, some of you that are watching from other places won't know these names, but um, uh, I want to call our congregation to prayer uh, two needs in particular. One, I spoke with uh, <clears throat> with Jane Long yesterday, and Randy is in the hospital in Montgomery expecting to have to have heart surgery, and there's some things that have to take place before that can happen. And so uh, he really needs a divine touch from the Lord, uh, and uh, it, it looks like it's going to be sort of a long ordeal for him. So if we could pray for Randy for God's healing touch in his body. And Joyce Wade is in the hospital as well, and so we need to pray that God would touch her. She desperately <clears throat> needs a touch from God tonight. And if you uh, haven't seen in the news, for those of you watching in Alabama, we, we had our first death from COVID-19 today in Alabama. It happened in Jefferson County in Birmingham. And so <clears throat> um, I don't know the name and don't know the situation or the age of the person or anything like that, but uh, uh, we just need to pray for... Um, pray for our state as we're praying for every state in our country and in every country around the world, in fact. So if we could take these needs, I didn't see any prayer requests. Oh, I see one now. We're going to pray for Francis Caesar. Uh, she has a terrible headache tonight. And so Francis, we love you and uh, <clears throat> appreciate you and Richard watching from Lakeland. So uh, we want to pray for you as well. Does uh, anybody else have a prayer request? If you can put it in the comments real quick and we will take that to the Lord right now. All right. Well, let's pray together one more time. Father, <clears throat> Thank you that you are as close as a mention of your name tonight. And God, we ask you to reach down and minister to each of these names that we've called out. We pray, Lord, for Joyce Wade. We ask you to touch her body, that, Lord, you would heal her heart, her mind, and give her clarity and thought once again, help her to recover her uh, blood levels and so forth, and give her, Lord, a divine, miraculous recovery. We pray for Randy tonight, that you would touch his heart, God, and heal every blockage, heal everything that is damaged in his heart tonight, and heal his body, make him whole tonight, and speak peace to him, we pray. And Lord, we pray for Francis. We ask you to touch her, Lord. Whatever the root of this headache is, we ask you, Lord, for a divine healing in her body. We command the pain to cease in the name of Jesus, and God, we thank you for it. We pray over the <clears throat> family that lost someone today to COVID-19 in, in Birmingham. We ask you for your comfort and peace. And Lord, we pray for the scientists and the uh, medical profession that is working long hours to try to find a cure or a vaccine for this virus. And we pray, God, that you would give them supernatural insights and wisdom 
And we ask you, Lord, for mercy over our nation and over the world from this virus tonight. And we thank you, God, that in spite of what we see in the news and what we see going on around us, we recognize that you are still in control. And in that, Lord, we rest and, Lord, we rejoice. Now, Lord, over our time together tonight, <clears throat> we ask you to speak to us clearly. I pray, God, for confidence, supernatural peace, supernatural faith as we face the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I mentioned a couple of things real quick. Uh, first of all, the Hope Center is still open. And, um, oh, okay. Uh, David South just shared that uh, uh, his son Chris just transported his first patient with COVID-19. And uh, why don't we take just another minute? Let's pray for Chris. If you don't know Chris, he's, a, he's an EMT in, up in North Dakota. <clears throat> and so um, let's pray for Chris. So he's, he's on the front lines of this. Father, we pray for Chris South now, and we ask you to touch him and protect him. Keep him safe, Lord, as he is uh, putting his life on the line to minister to those who are suffering and those who are sick tonight. We ask you, God, uh, just to wrap your arms around him with divine protection. And God, we thank you for it tonight in Jesus' precious name. <clears throat> Amen. Excuse me for coughing. So um, the Hope Center is still open, and uh, we're taking appointments only. We're not opening during the week, but uh, if there is someone who has a need for groceries or for clothing, we will uh, set up an appointment with them. They can message the Hope Center's uh, Facebook page or, um, or call the church office, extension 3, and leave a message, and that message is immediately forwarded to Cheryl, and, and so we're happy to help out. We helped out a family this week. And I got pictures from the family today of all the kids that uh, received all these new clothes and, and they were so excited and that, stuff like that is just awesome. It's just, you know, that's what the church is for, is to, uh, is to be on the, on the front lines to help those who are hurting. And so the, the fact that we get the privilege of doing this is just absolutely wonderful. And I just appreciate everyone that's worked so hard to bring the Hope Center to fruition. Um, I want to thank everybody who has been giving during this time. The bills do still keep coming in. Daniel's been writing uh, checks to pay bills today, in fact, and uh, several of you have mailed your tithes in, several of you have given online, some of you, I think, for the first time, and so thank you for that. And uh, so to give your tithes and offerings, <clears throat> there's a couple of things you could do. One, you can uh, mail it in through, uh, through snail mail, as they call it now, and uh, Daniel will put the, uh, the mailing address in the comments below. And then <clears throat> if you want to give online, you can do it one of two ways. You can go to our website, which is nlag.cc slash give, nlag. Find our name in the list when you search for churches near you, and you can give there and, and uh, designate, uh, designate it to however you would like to give that money. Uh, thank you for your continued giving, and I want to assure you that all online giving is 100% secure. Uh, we wouldn't do it if it wasn't, and so uh, we, we want to be very careful uh, with the money that you're entrusting to us as you give to the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, all right. Well, let's get into the Word tonight. I want to talk to you tonight on the topic of when God doesn't make sense. This is actually a series we're going to begin. Um, it'll last the next couple of weeks. And we're going to look at a couple of different ways that God doesn't sometimes meet our expectations. Now, can we just be honest and admit that? That sometimes what we want to happen <clears throat> is not what God causes to happen, right? And so how do we deal with that? Look at our current events in the world today, and, and it's, it's easy to look around at COVID-19 and Say, what in the world is going on? And we want to say, where is God in the midst of all of this? And there was an earthquake off the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean yesterday caused tsunami warnings and, uh, on the West Coast and in Hawaii. And there's all these threats of war. And there's so many things going on around us. And, and, and we sometimes say, God, why don't you just fix this? Well, I want to warn you that some of you may not like this series because it, it may be frustrating to you. You're going to hear some things you don't like. Because what I want to tell you up front is for soon. We may not be sequestered in our homes like we are now, but they're saying that life may not return to normal till June and possibly even later. And so understand that, that we're dealing with a long-term situation and there's going to probably be economic consequences. 
Uh, in fact, uh, it, perhaps you are already, I've, I've been hearing that there are some of our folks already feeling the effects financially from this. And so if that's you, we want to agree with you in prayer for God's supernatural provision. And so understand that this could be a long road. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's, it may not be over as quickly as we would like. Aren't you glad you tuned in tonight? <laughs> Good news. <laughs> so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at three different stories in the New Testament. And the three themes are when God seems to be inattentive, or when he's not paying attention, it seems like, when God is uncooperative, and when God is late. Now understand these are all from our perspective, and we're going to unpack that together tonight. At some point in your life, have you ever prayed, and it seemed like God was inattentive, uncooperative, or late? And to make matters worse, I think we've all had that experience, but then we look for comfort from some of our brothers and sisters, and there's always those people that are praise the Lord everything, right? I mean, come on, let's be real, you know? Uh, and, and, and we want to uh, we want to be those people sometimes that are always looking on the positive side, but let's just be really honest. Sometimes those people are really annoying, aren't they? Because we're hurting and we're searching for answers, and, you know, they're just like, you just got to believe God, brother, you know, and... <laughs> And, and, and it just doesn't help things, does it? Um, then there's the, the preacher stories about miracles and all these different things. And it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like Job's friends in the midst of all of this. They, they want to give you all the answers. And yet it seems like that no matter what anybody tells you or what anybody prays, the situation doesn't change. Where's God in all of this? What do you do when it seems like God is inattentive, when it seems like God's not paying attention? Here's the main idea for tonight. Just because God is absent, or excuse me, <laughs> that's the problem with doing it live. I can't go back and edit that when I mess it up. Let me, read, let me start that over. Just because God is silent doesn't mean that God is absent. Just because God is silent, it doesn't mean that God is absent. Let's look at John the Baptist tonight. Now, John is Jesus' cousin, first cousin. Uh, he's a prophet, son of a priest. And he's out in the desert, he's out in the wilderness uh, wearing animal skins, eating locusts and honey. Kind of an odd person, and most prophets are a little odd. And he's out there in the wilderness coming into town only to proclaim this message to prepare the way of the Lord and to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And he was a hero among the common people because he stood up to those in authority who were wrong and he didn't take anything off of anybody. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to corner him, he told them off and put them in their place. And so he was, he was a hero. He was, he was the people's uh, champion. And here's the context. Now, the, the leader in this, in this region where he was was Herod Antipas. And Herod uh, had married, he, well, he was, he was married and he fell in love with his brother's wife, Herodias. So he divorced his wife, married his brother's wife, and brought her into the palace with him. Uh, and we think that Politics is weird today. Uh, so, you know, everybody's too afraid to say anything to him, but John the Baptist steps up and calls him out, calls him to repentance. And the thing was, Herod actually liked to listen to John and was a fan of his. He would, he would listen to his sermons, but his wife Herodias hated John, hated him with a passion. And so... She convinces Herod Antipas to have John the Baptist arrested. So we pick up this story in Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 17. It says, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put into prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. 
So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. So what do we have here? John is faithfully serving God. John's doing everything right as far as we can tell. He's pointing people to Jesus. When people want to follow him, he points them instead to Jesus. He's preparing the way for Jesus' arrival. And he says, don't follow me, follow Jesus. He, says, he, he looks to Jesus and says, I am not worthy to uh, untie his sandals. And when he baptizes Jesus, Jesus comes to him for baptism. And he says, I'm not worthy to, to baptize you. I should be the one being baptized by you. But Jesus convinces him and he relents and, and baptizes him. So then John's arrested. And, and understand this, John is imprisoned for doing what's right. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is funny to me, and I'm going to pick on my pastor friends for, for just a moment. Uh, last night, uh, these Facebook Live videos, like the one we're watching right now, disappeared from Facebook. And, um, and so, so immediately, I saw a lot of pastors going on Facebook and declaring that, you know, uh, the, the, the leaders at Facebook were taking our videos down because we're preaching the gospel. So I stopped and I investigated it, and it's a glitch. It was a glitch. In fact, it was still on your desktop. If you went in a browser, it just wasn't on the app because of a glitch. And they were updating their servers because, get this, they were so overwhelmed by all the, the churches broadcasting on Sunday, it was causing problems with their servers. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? And so it wasn't persecution, Okay. We just crashed the internet. We broke the internet Sunday. And, and so it's interesting how we sometimes think that we're so persecuted, in, at least here in America. Um, and I saw someone post today that, you know, if we don't get to come together for Easter and put on our big pageantries and all those different things, he said, understand this, we're just getting one small taste of the world that the persecuted church lives in every single day. Just a little glimpse of it, not even really a full taste of it. And so understand this, that, um, that, that we feel sorry for ourselves. If you're an extrovert right now, you feel really sorry for yourselves because you can't go and be with people. Um, if you're an introvert, you're probably just rejoicing right now. But, uh, you know, understand this, we will suffer for doing right. And until we're put into prison or until we start losing our lives for our faith, let's not call it persecution. Let's call it inconvenienced. <laughs> John was persecuted, and he was doing everything right. So if I'm John the Baptist, and this happened to me, I'm put in prison for doing right. Um, I, I, if I'm standing up for Jesus, and Jesus is out there performing miracles, what do you think I'm going to expect as John the Baptist, his first cousin, the one preparing the way, the one sent in the spirit of Elijah, the one that uh, is doing it all right and is being persecuted for his faith? What am I going to expect Jesus the miracle worker to do for me? I would expect him to do a miracle, right? In fact, if I'm in prison, I'm kind of expecting one of those angel moments to where the angel comes and opens the door and, 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 and says, you're free. And so John waited in prison for Jesus to send an angel to break him out. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And Jesus just went on doing his ministry. Do you think John stayed strong in his faith? Or do you think he struggled? Now, one thing I love about the scriptures is they don't paint rosy pictures of our heroes. They let us know, the scriptures let us know when our heroes show their human side. And John was not superhuman. He was a human being, and he did what many of us would do. He started asking questions. And he started having second thoughts about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, 
verses 2 and 3. It says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, watch this, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? In other words, to put it in our vernacular, John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Was I wrong about you? This is the man who baptized Jesus saying, you should be baptizing me. Then the next day, his disciples show up, John's disciples, and he points to Jesus walking along the way and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. He must increase and I must decrease. And this is the same one now saying, Are you the one or should we look for another? Now, if we're honest, many of us have had moments like that. What if I'm wrong about this Jesus thing? Sometimes when, when life doesn't go according to our plan, we, the, the, um, the false assumptions of our faith get revealed to us. Not to say that our faith is false, it's simply to say that we sometimes mix in with our genuine faith certain assumptions, whether they are culturally imposed or whether it's something that we have uh, brought as our expectation to the scriptures or to our relationship with Christ. And anything that is really not from genuine faith will sooner or later get tested to the point that it gets shaken and falls away. We find out then what parts of our faith are really genuine. So John sends his representatives to Jesus. Was I wrong about you? Should I be looking for someone else? And, and Jesus did not say to him, did not say to the disciples, go back and tell John, of course I'm the Messiah. Just be cool, John. I, I'm coming at midnight to break you out. Okay, just relax. Hang on just a little bit longer. It's not what Jesus said. Look at verse 4 of Matthew 11. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now, if we stop there, we can make the assumption that Jesus is saying this to prove that he's the Messiah. So I'm doing this, I'm healing people, I'm raising the dead, I'm, I'm, I'm proclaiming the good news to the poor, so see John, I really am the Messiah, I'm doing all the good things. We would assume that's what Jesus was saying, but that's not what he's saying at all. Because watch this next line, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, now hang on a second. I don't know about you, but if I'm in John's, if I'm in John's shoes apart from the whole prison thing, but if I'm like a minister in Jesus' day and, and Jesus says, okay, when I show up, the deaf are going to hear, the blind are going to see, the, the lame are going to walk, the poor are going to have the gospel, the good news preached to them, and, and great things are going to happen. I don't know about you, but that would not be a stumbling block to me, right? I'd be like, okay, finally, revival is here, right? I mean, I'm not going to be like, well, I'll tell you one thing. If one more blind person gets healed, I'm out of here. It's not what I would say. So, so why is Jesus inserting this statement, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me? Here's what Jesus is telling John. John, I'm not going to get you out of prison. I am doing what my Father in heaven has called me to do. I am, I am fulfilling the calling on my life. And that does not include breaking you out of prison, John. And he says, there's a blessing for you on the other side of this if you do not stumble and grow offended. Now that's a gut punch, isn't it? John, I'm not going to meet your expectations. But there is a blessing for you if this does not cause you to stumble.
So the next thing that happens here, there's a party at the palace. Everybody's drunk, including Herod. Herodias' daughter Salome dances. Now, I don't want to get too graphic here, but let's just think about this for a second. How was she dancing? Was she dancing ballet? Not likely. Probably something closer to twerking, you know. I mean, probably something very sensual and sexual. And Herod is just eat up with her. And the king, showing off, says to her, what do you want? Name it. I'll give anything to you, up to half of the kingdom, he says. Now, this is a teenage girl, which, first of all, ew, Herod, you know. But he, he, he offers her anything she wants up to half of his kingdom. So a teenage girl, what's she going to want? A pony? An iPhone? You know, tickets to a Justin Bieber concert or whoever's popular now? I don't know. I'm out of the loop. Uh, what does she ask for? Well, she goes to her mom and says, what should I ask for? And her mom tells, tells her what she wants. And so uh, Salome goes to, back to Herod and says, here's what I want. I want the head of the Baptist on the platter. I want John's head. Now, this is one of those moments where a miracle would have been fantastic. I mean, so, so what happens? I want the head of the Baptist, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake, and an angel appears and blinds Herodias, and everybody falls dead. And then music begins to swell, and smoke fills the room, and out through the smoke walks, walks someone with blue face like Mel Gibson, yelling, Freedom! John is set free and meets and marries the love of his life, probably an animal skin model, and they have two kids and a dog and live happily ever after. Right? Is that what happens? No, that's not what happens. That's what we want to happen. And that's what happens in the Hollywood version of things when God shows up, right? But no, that's not what happens. In Mark chapter 6, we get the rest of the story. In verse 26, it says, The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath... And his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. The prophet of God. This same man, after he sent his disciples to Jesus, when the disciples left to go back to give John the report, Jesus turned to his own disciples and he said, no greater man has ever lived than John the Baptist. And yet this great man did not have the victory in the end that we wanted him to have. From the flesh, from a natural perspective, it appears that he lost. Jesus had the power to rescue John. But he didn't. Where is God in that moment? Now, let's step back from the emotion of that event and, and let's see what really happened from heaven's perspective. John's ultimate desire was fulfilled. Because, see, in the moment of his discouragement, dare say his moment of fear, he wanted to be set free from prison. But when he was out fulfilling the call of God in his life and preaching the gospel and pointing the way to Jesus, his desire was fulfilled. He did prepare the way for the Messiah. He fulfilled the call of God on his life. And more importantly, God's purpose was fulfilled. But just not according to John's plan. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So, here's what I need you to understand tonight. You don't have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. 
You don't have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. You don't have to understand what's happening. You don't have to be able to give some kind of prophetic explanation of why COVID-19 is spreading across the earth the way it is right now. We don't, have, we don't know those answers, and I would dare say that anyone who tells you that they have a handle on it is wrong. You don't have to understand it. You say, well, did God send COVID-19 as judgment? I don't know. To be blunt, I really don't think so. So is it the enemy? Is it Satan? I don't know. Maybe. There, but there's this other thing. You see, you have these things called germs. <laughs> And, and they are tiny organisms, and there's, there's viruses, and this is a new virus that has developed, and it happens. And here's the thing. Regardless of where it came from, Jesus told us these things were going to happen. This didn't catch God by surprise. Jesus said in the last days there will be wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, and all these different things, and, and they're happening with increasing uh, uh, frequency in the recent in recent decades even more so in recent years and so whatever whether it's satan whether it's god whether it's just a natural phenomenon the point is simply this that jesus told us this would happen and you say so are you saying jesus is about to come back i'm saying that we are closer today than we were yesterday and that events like the COVID-19 pandemic should cause us to look to heaven and be aware that our king is coming. And so rather than trying to explain everything away, because and the reason we do that is because we think by explaining it, we gain some control over it. And, and I'm just going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, we don't have control over this thing. And that's why we need to trust God. You don't have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. Now, now, some of us may have some upper tier problems. We prayed for, for someone and they still died. Uh, we worked hard but lost our job. Maybe some are struggling with depression. Some are struggling with migraines. And Listen, I don't have all the answers to all those things. All I know for sure is that we are in a fallen world that is crying out for its redemption. It's longing for the day that Jesus comes to finish the work he started in the earth. But here's what we need to understand tonight. We must not interpret the goodness of God through our circumstances. We interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. Did you hear me? We don't interpret our circumstances, or excuse me, we don't interpret the goodness of God through our circumstances, but we interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. We believe God is good, period. He can't be anything but good. <clears throat> and so knowing that He is good can bring us to trust in His purpose no matter what we face. You may have hit one of those moments. You may be looking around you right now and saying, okay, God, what's the plan? And God may not tell you the plan, but he's saying to you, trust my purpose. My faith is not in my plan. My faith is in God's purpose. Here's what we need to understand. You are not the center actor in this play. And neither am I. Believe it or not, the world does not revolve around you or me. And Jesus had a moment like this where he was taking a good look at God's plan. And, you know, we, we, we talk about Jesus' divinity and he was divine. He is divine. He is God, the Son, According to John 1, eternally existent from eternity past and was a key element in creation. Jesus is eternal. But he took on flesh and he wasn't some God-man hybrid. He wasn't half God, half man. He was fully God and yet fully man. And sometimes we emphasize the fully God part to, to the point that we neglect the fully man part. And as he's facing the cross and knowing what's about to happen... His humanity is on display here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, God, if there's any other way, 
If there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. But then he says, yet not what I will, but what you will be done. He trusts in God the Father's purpose. And then on the cross, even in the midst of fulfilling his purpose in life, he cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I believe the reason he did that, obviously he's quoting the Psalms, fulfilling the prophecy that's in the Psalms. But that is his humanity crying out and his divinity even crying out because in that moment he is completely separated for the first time in eternity from the Father and from the Spirit. And so he has known a divine community for eternity past. Whoops, sorry, I didn't hear that. But if, in the, if you heard that, I bumped the mic. You probably heard a boom there on the internet. I'm sorry about that. But in that moment, Jesus experiences that separation. That community is ripped from him as God is separated from him in that moment on the cross. And he cries out, God, why have you forsaken me? That is the loneliness and the despair of his humanity in that most vulnerable second of his life. And in that moment, he's crying out. And yet it seems that his father is silent and inattentive. And yet Jesus still knew that as, even though his father was silent, he was not absent. Because when it was accomplished, when it was finished, he said, it is accomplished and said, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. He knew that his father was there to receive him. And so <clears throat> I think that in, in some small way we can say that same prayer. That even when God seems silent and we don't understand what's happening and the pain around us is so severe that we feel like we've been uh, abandoned by God, we can still know that even though he's silent, he's not absent. And we can still say, Lord, I commit my spirit into your hands. I trust you. I trust you. Now, does God answer prayer? Absolutely, he answers prayer. We've seen God work miracles right here in this room where I'm sitting. But there will be those occasions where our plans do not match God's purposes. God's will is not always a matter of the circumstances around us. But it's a matter of our response to the circumstances. And so... <clears throat> You know, we can <clears throat> pray against the COVID-19 virus, and we should. <clears throat> we can pray that God would stop it, and we should. And we are believing God for that. But what if this does drag on? Is God failing? No. God's purposes will be fulfilled. So the question is not whether God is answering our prayers. The, the question is, are we attentive to God's purpose? And I guarantee you, as I said, this did not catch God by surprise. And wherever you are right now, whatever your life situation is, your responsibility is to respond to God's purpose as best you know how. You say, well, I don't know what my purpose is. Then you hang on till God reveals it to you. God doesn't have a speech impediment. He can communicate it to you when the time is right. In the meantime, you rest in him. And trust his purpose. So as, um, as Keith comes back to lead us in one more song, I want to ask you, <clears throat> forgive me for coughing so much tonight, allergies, ugh, Alabama, oy. Um, do you have a weight on you that you wish God would take off of you today? Do you have... Uh, a situation in your life where you're saying, God, are you paying attention? I want to assure you that even though God may be silent, he is not absent. And I want to encourage you to simply commit yourself, commit your spirit, commit your life into his hands and say, God, whatever your purposes are for me, I will trust you. Now, if you're watching tonight and 
you know that things are not right between you and the Lord. You have an opportunity right now to put Jesus back in the center of your life. Or maybe you've never done that before. Maybe this would be the first time. You have an opportunity to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. You know, what I'm talking about tonight is not religion. It's not just starting to follow new rules. It's about a relationship. And in this relationship, Jesus transforms us into a new person. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And it could be that the circumstances you find yourself in, God may have allowed them in your life simply to get your attention so that you have no choice but to face your eternity. And if that's the case, this is actually a very exciting time because God has your attention. Would you call out to Him today? <clears throat> I could give you a lengthy theological explanation of what happens, but let me just give you something really simple. You can pray to Jesus right now. You can say, Jesus, take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and make me new and I will follow you. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new and I will follow you. It is that Simple. If you pray that prayer right now, there is a transformation that God is about to do in your life. If you pray that, would you email me? You can email me at pastorchad at nlag.cc. Daniel's going to put that in the comments. Send me an email and I'll contact you and follow up with you. But please don't waste your pain. There is always a purpose in the pain. Don't waste it. Let God accomplish His purpose in you. Now, if you're a follower of Christ tonight and you find yourself in that painful moment saying, God, where are you? Are you even paying attention? Would you just turn your heart toward Him right now and simply say, Jesus, I commit my spirit into your hands. I trust your purpose. I trust you with my life. And I'm trusting you to lead me through this. You understand, if we do that, God's purposes will be accomplished through us and God will get the glory. God will work miracles. God will do amazing things if we will let Him. But we have to give up our fantasy of a plan and let God's purpose be fulfilled. Father, have Your way. In each of us tonight, Lord, have Your way. Let your purpose be fulfilled. And Lord, we, tonight we confess that we recognize that even when you are silent, you are not absent. And when we don't understand the plan, we trust your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together for just a moment. Pastor Keith's going to lead us in a song. Please don't go away.
Amen. I hope that's your prayer tonight. I hope that's your statement of faith, your declaration. I give myself away that you can use me. Even in the midst of our having to stay at home and all this routine being so upended, there's purpose for you. God has purpose for you tonight. So thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service online. This uh, live stream will remain on our Facebook page. It will also be available soon on our YouTube page, our Vimeo page. And uh, we're working on a new platform that will be a lot more interactive, and hopefully we'll have that up in the next week or so. Thank you so much for continuing to, uh, to, to just worship with us online. Let me speak to my congregation at New Life for just a moment, too, as we close. We're in the process of putting together some care groups. Uh, I want to be able to stay in touch with everybody, uh, even though we can't come together in one building on Sundays. And so we're, we're setting up some groups, and we're going to have care group leaders that will be staying in contact with you and, uh, and, and calling to check on you to find out if there's anything you need while we're being uh, isolated and quarantined. So um, you can expect a call from someone in the next week or so, well, in the next few days even. And I'll be calling on some of you to help us out as care leaders. Uh, in the meantime, if you have a need, if you come across a financial need, uh, if you need help with groceries, uh, if, if you just need someone to talk to, please do call us at the church office. You can leave a message at the church office that immediately gets forwarded to me. And uh, you, can, you can text me, you can email me. Um, and, and we're here. We're here together, okay? We are in this thing together. And, and this is a perfect opportunity for the church to be the church. I was listening to one pastor today, and he was saying, you know, the church is not optional. <laughs> it's, it's a necessity. God knew what he was doing when he established the church. So let's be the church. Amen. I love you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Father, I pray your blessings upon each one that's uh, watched tonight. And uh, help us, Lord, to be mindful of your purpose and to follow where you lead. And we thank you, God, for your faithfulness to us in the midst of all of this. In Jesus' powerful name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. See you Sunday morning.